welcome to another edition of History Gone Viral. My name is Becky Liner and I'm the Executive Vice President of the James Madison Institute. The James Madison Institute also has the Preston A. Wells Jr. Center for American Ideals. And through that center, we promote civics education for elementary, middle and high school students, as well as programming for college students. History Gone Viral, is a program of that center. And we're very happy today to introduce you to someone who's been very important in not only Florida's history, but in our country's history, and in particular, as it relates to education. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill Maddox, who's the head of our Stanley Marshall Center for Educational Options. And uh, Bill, take it away. Thank you, Becky. Um... Becky's right. I uh, work at the, Jam at the James Madison Institute uh, in our Stanley Marshall Center for Educational Options. And I should say something about Dr. Marshall in the intro here to our special guest. Um, Dr. Marshall, after serving as president of Florida State University, spent some time serving on the board of trustees at Bethune-Cookman um, University and was a big uh, fan of and had been inspired greatly by our special guest today, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. In fact, um, not long after we moved into our new building in Tallahassee, I remember once going to Dr. Uh, Marshall's office to visit him. And we had just moved in and all along the edge of the room, there were all sorts of uh, certificates and diplomas and memorabilia from his long public life, including I remember a photograph of um, Dr. Marshall with the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher, um, that all of these were kind of waiting to be hung on the walls there of his office. But there was one item that Dr. Marshall cared so much about that before a decorator came in to put up all the others, he put this item up himself. And it was a big, large portrait of Mary McLeod Bethune, which he hung right behind his desk. And that I think um, signaled to all the esteem in which he held our special guest today. So it's my pleasure to welcome all the way from Daytona Beach, Florida, uh, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. Dr. Bethune, thank you for joining us on History Gone Viral. Well, greetings and thank you for inviting me. I look forward to our conversation. So I know there are many Florida students who will have some familiarity with your story, but we really wanna dig down into the details and, real, and, and start at the beginning. So why don't you tell us here uh, at the outset um, a little bit about your childhood, where you were born, what life was like then, and, and, and perhaps especially uh, how you learned to read. Mm. Well, I was born in Maysville, South Carolina. And I was number 15 of 17 children. And Obviously back then it was a rural area and I worked in cotton fields and I made myself useful as a child. And my parents were former slaves. And after emancipation, I was the first to be born into freedom of the 17 children, I was number 16. And one day, we were going to the home of a woman she was once a slave of. And she was going to carry a load of wash. Now I was all excited because I was going to play with the little children in the yard. And all was well when I played mammy to their little dolls. But when I reached for something that caught my eye and I picked it up, I heard, put that down. You can't read. And not only was that child telling me I could not read, but that I should not read. And that did something to me. It hurt me to my core could not read, which was true, but should not read is what hurt me dearly. And I thought that to be the worst day of my life. 
but it may in fact have been the best day because I became bound and determined that I was going to learn to read. So tell me then some about your kind of formal education. I mean, there was a time when you traipsed off all the way to Chicago to get some additional um, uh, training. Tell us a little bit about your formal education and why, why Chicago? What were you hoping to do there or to become? I wanted to become a mission, a missionary and go back to Africa and hear the drums that beat in my mother and father's heart that I'd heard about so often. And I wanted to do something good for my people, the people from which my parents came. And so Moody Bible Institute promised such a program. And I did everything I was supposed to do. I was a top student, dedicated to both physical and intellectual work. So when that fateful day arrived, when I was supposed to get my assignment, I was ready. And, and, you, and you left Chicago and returned then to the Southeast and began teaching, yeah? Yes, my first assignment was in Augusta, Georgia with Lucy, Lucy Laney and Haynes Institute. And it was there that I determined what I wanted to be. I could see the person I wanted to evolve into because she loved her little ones and she dealt with them in such a wonderful way. I then became aware of the need for our missionary spirit right here in these United States. So in time, you made your way to Florida, to Daytona Beach, and decided to start a school there for um, young girls. And I'm guessing must have just had lots of money in your pocket to get things started. Tell us a little bit about what it was like starting a school from scratch, how much money you, you did start with and what you guys did to raise money and to provide supplies for your school. Well, I came to Florida from Savannah, Georgia and went to Palatka first because Re Reverend Uggams wanted me to start a school in Palatka. And it was a part of my mission. I, it was a part of my soul. So I had to go. We started that school and the students came and we took the school to them. I followed those young people to the sawmill, into the field, even in the joke joints did whatever I needed to do in order to help them learn. Now you laugh like you were there. <laughs> I thought I recognized you from there. <laughs> but I was there for five years before what you mentioned came into my world. Another pastor asked me to come to Daytona to start a school because the railroad was coming down into Florida and workers were following the work that went along with building those tracks or laying those tracks and their families were following them. Now the women could do domestic work, but the children were left with nothing constructive to do. And the conditions were, were horrible. So I had to go. And I went into Daytona and having made that commitment, had to find a school or a building or something to start that school. Looked all over Daytona, up and down dusty roads and finally came across a road that was three blocks long and unpaved. And the owner offered to sell, not sell, but he offered to allow me to rent that building for $11 a month. Hmm. Now I only had a dollar and 50 cents. That was a birthday present from my husband, but I told him I would find a way to get the rest of the money. And God bless his soul. He allowed us to do that and decided to let us rent the, 
the building on Oak Street. So I recall reading that you um, you guys like took old discarded crates and made desks and found elderberry juice and used it for ink for your uh, uh, pens and things of that nature. Um, and, that, and that you also um, taught the young ladies how to bake so that you could sell pies to uh, tourists and others that were coming to raise money um, for the school. Um, what, what, what exactly did um, your girls think of all of these activities and how and why was it that you combined a lot of these practical skills that you were teaching them with the academic subjects uh, in your school? Why was that such an area of emphasis? Let's start back at the beginning of that question. Okay. <laughs> we went into the dump and found broken chairs, discarded crates to use as desks, Butcher block paper is what we wrote on with sticks that we dipped into elderberry juice to write with. We use the resources that we had in order for these dedicated young children to learn. Oftentimes the things that we were required to spend money on and to feed the young people, we had to be resourceful in terms of the agriculture. That was a discipline that we could teach them how to grow things and then how to prepare those things to eat. And then we could use some of those things to sell and make money. I taught them to be useful just as I was useful as a child. Uh, the, reason, the reason that I embrace intellectual learning as well as the practical learning is one, I just explained the practical part, but you have to understand life, understand how and when to use the skills that you have, be productive, create, and then understand why. Yeah, I know that along that, uh, along those same lines during that same time period, uh, Booker T. Washington and other African-American educators uh, did that kind of blending of, of uh, academic training along with practical skill building um, to prepare people for, um, you know, practical work as well as um, uh, intellectual pursuits uh, as well. Now, I, I know that you had a, a number of um, wealthy businessmen from up north who traveled down and discovered your school and ended up uh, being a great help to you. Tell us a little about some of these relationships and how you got to know some of these wealthy financiers and why they took such an interest in your school. Well, when you are working with the grace of God and with a purpose, you have no fear in approaching people to share with them the benefits that they can receive on a personal basis if they help us with the mission that we have at hand. So I approached the wealthy people that were coming in following that railroad and coming into Florida to tell them about my dream. And when we opened Bethune-Cookman College and wanted to grow, I wanted it to be on land that we owned and I wanted it to be legal with a board of, direction, board of directors. So I approached James P. Gamble of Procter & Gamble. When I walked into his office, he was startled and said, I thought you were white. No, but I had a dream and I had a, a I had I had a dream, I had 
a mission. I had ideals that I wanted him to see. And he agreed to follow me to the school. And when we arrived and he saw these dedicated young people sitting at these desks made out of crates and on broken patched up chairs, he asked, Mrs. Bethune, where is the school you want me to be a trustee of? <laughs> I said, in my heart. And he saw the dream and became a lifetime benefactor. He, along with anyone else that I could approach, white of white sewing machine, there were several people, the Roosevelt's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's exciting and encouraging to learn that there were folks who came to your aid and were able to help um, get the school off the ground and to um, help it, you know, find success. But I know that it wasn't always easy and that you didn't always get kind treatment from others. Tell yeah. us about the night, for example, I remember you describing this once before for me, um, the night when um, the KKK came looking uh, to find you guys, and you were all huddled in your uh, school. Tell us about that incident and what exactly happened. Well, it was prompted by the fact that there was a mayoral candidate that we were not happy with because he did not believe in higher education for Negro students. And women had earned the right to vote. Men had gotten it years before, but women finally got it. So I marched around that city, knocking on every door I could to get people out to vote. And that angered some people. And someone told me that they were gonna ride that night. And I knew something was up because they had gotten with the crooked officials and turned off all the lights leading up to Faith Hall. So I gathered the students and we went into Faith Hall and we waited. And then we heard the noise and the chatter and the horses baying and the hoofs on the pavement, not the pavement, but on the ground. We, we just, we, we heard this and, and it was just awful. And then I had an idea that I was gonna turn the lights off in Faith Hall. And when I turned the lights off, one child screamed. And when one screamed, they all screamed. So God bless her soul, one child started singing. Be not dismayed, whatever be time, God will take care of you. And another child joined in and their voices got louder and louder and stronger and stronger. And as they turned into the yard and the clan came into view with that burning cross, I turned off the lights in the yard. You see, there were doctors and lawyers and people that did not necessarily want people to know they were out there. And when they heard our praise for God and our voices lifted, lifting to the heavens, they decided not to mess with God's children that day. They turned and went away. The next morning we rose and marched to the polls and our candidate won. <laughs> That's an awesome story. Um... The, uh, not only did you have to show courage and your students have to show courage in um, situations like that, but I know that you also at times had to show grace and to be long suffering and to allow people who slighted you, um, to, to deal with people who slighted you in ways that were most effective. And I'm reminded of an incident that arose with um, some folks at a, at a fellow college in Orlando uh, that uh, initially uh, invited you to come speak, but then withdrew their invitation and 
um, tell us a little bit about that incident, because that I thought was uh, one I remember that Dr. Marshall especially um, took inspiration from. Well, Hamilton Hope, my dear friend and president at the time of Rollins College. He invited me to speak and then later wanted to award me with an honorary doctorate. There was such a ruckus about that that he's, he was threatened, his job was threatened and I had to pull him aside and say, look, you are doing such good work. We can't afford to have you moved away from your job at this point. You need to stay in your post. He complied. He withdrew the offer for that honor to be bestowed on me. But when he retired, his last official act was to honor me, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, with that designation. So over the course of time, in part because of the grace that you had shown and the, um, the, the, the ability to kind of overlook being mistreated, um, people's hearts were changed and they came yeah. around and, and ended up doing what they should have done in the, in the beginning. And I have to believe that getting that honorary degree after all of that must have been deeply satisfying to you, yes? Satisfying and I was appreciative. And I valued this friendship from a man that was truly a good man. There was another um, way in which you kind of showed remarkable uh, grace and influence there in your home city, uh, Daytona, that a lot of people probably don't um, know or, or um, understand, and that's this. Uh, later this year, we're, we're now here, uh, I'm speaking to you from 2021, and uh, here in another month or so, we're going to be celebrating the 75th anniversary of, of the first game that Jackie Robinson ever played um, in a major league uh, uh, it, contest. It was played on a minor league field during spring training in Daytona um, back in uh, 1946. And Daytona was the only place in Florida, in America, that would, during spring training, that would allow um, the Dodgers to play with Jackie on the team. He was playing then for their minor league affiliate, Montreal. But there were a number of other places, sadly, nearby that refused to allow Robinson to play. But Daytona stood out as um, a place that was welcoming of him and welcoming of the integration of Major League Baseball. And I have to believe, so tell me, tell me some about kind of your role in the city and the influence of your college on the city. Because I have to believe that it wasn't an accident that the place where Bethune Cookman stood was the one place that had the uh, wisdom to welcome Jackie Robinson. And I, Mary McCall Bethune, and Bethune-Cookman College welcomed this young man on our campus. It was a safekeeping, a, a, a safety, har safe harbor for him during this time because it was not an easy thing to be in his position. And people look to me and the college for wrapping these events into our, bringing them into our fold, wrapping our arms around these young people and giving them salt, giving them courage, giving them direction. We knew him and his family 
because of the college. He withstood a great deal and he represented all of us. We had to protect him. And what better place than Daytona when you had Bethune-Cookman College there setting an example for the state and for the nation. And with my having access to the White House and knowing that young people needed opportunities and speaking on behalf of young people nationally, and I was not going to support this young man, of course I was. Well, no, it's a it's a great story. And I know a few years after that uh, first game, um, Bethune Cookman gave Robinson along with Branch Rickey, the Dodgers uh, uh, general manager who had signed him, both uh, honorary degrees, which I thought was just a nice gesture as well. So you re you mentioned in the course of that uh, uh, response some of your national influence, and we really haven't talked a lot about this. But once you had established the school had helped it to get off the ground and were, people were seeing these graduates that were doing great things, you really gained quite a national platform and um, worked, I know, uh, for a number of years with an organization that you started, the National Council of Negro Women, um, and then served in other capacities. Tell us a little bit about some of your work at the national level, what motivated you to do that, and what parts of those tasks you most enjoyed. Well, the work that I did here in Florida caught the attention of those in Washington, D.C. First being that which, which happened during that storm where so many people died, that hurricane just wiped out lives. I was even called down to the glades to pray over a mass grave. We were dedicated to improving the lives of these desperate people following the storm. And the question came whether or not Negroes should be in the Red Cross. They brought me to Washington to talk about that. They weren't so sure. They wanted to include us. But my thought is, does, if you're floating down a river, does it matter the, hand, the color of the hand that reaches out to help you? I suggest not. And whatever words I spoke were words that they decided needed to be heard around the nation because we travel, myself and two other white women, speaking on the merits of Negroes in the Red Cross. And you know the outcome of that. Mm -hmm. That exists to this day <laughs> because we advocated for it. Mm -hmm. I was brought to DC to work with Re President Roosevelt and the National Youth Association. And my responsibility was to look at the conditions of Blacks and young people all over the country and determine what their needs were. One such need is that they needed to be able to have some of the skills that were needed at wartime. Why couldn't they learn to fly airplanes? So the pilot civil, the pilot, excuse me, the civil pilot program was created and placed on various campuses. One such campus was Tuskegee, and from there came the Tuskegee Airmen. Hmm. And I would venture to say that there are some people that you know to this day that would not exist had it not been for those young men. I asked, was your grandfather in the war and was he a pilot? If he was, you might have not been here <laughs> if the airmen had not existed. That's awesome. So you mentioned in the course of that, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, and I know that you had a long-standing friendship both with him and with his wife, Eleanor, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Tell us a little bit about what it was like serving in FDR's Black Cabinet, and, and then tell us especially about your friendship with Eleanor. 
the Black Cabinet. I'm credited with bringing them together. And the sole purpose was to make sure that they communicated with each other. One person may be responsible for one department and another one responsible for a totally different department. But as Black appointed and elected officials, they needed to work together. I did not care what their individual responsibilities were. They needed to understand the responsibilities of their fellow service person. Whatever your service was, you needed to understand so you could communicate, you could understand, you can recognize opportunities. You can bring someone else to the table when needed. My association with the Roosevelt's was a very pleasant one. We were mutually beneficial. They had goals, they had objectives, they had responsibility, they had challenges that needed to be addressed. And I was the person that could help them understand the magnitude of certain issues or help them understand that the issues even existed. I remember going into President Roosevelt's office and he greeted me with such cheer. Mrs. Bethune, it's so wonderful to see you. I said, I don't know why, I'm always asking for something. And he replied, yes, but never for yourself. Ellen and I met when I attended a banquet when they were in the governor's mansion in New York. And her mother and I had worked together with women's organizations. And she saw me at the door, realizing that all conversation had stopped, looking to see where I was going to sit. So Sarah Roosevelt promptly took my hand, escorted me to her table, and seated me between herself and Eleanor Roosevelt. That's how that friendship began. Now, Eleanor had been in a position to do many good things as the First Lady, as life would have it. But she consulted me on many occasions. And I volunteered information that she needed to know. And then before we knew it, we were absolutely friends. Mm -hmm. She was welcome in my home in Daytona any time that she was in Florida. Well, and I seem to recall that after her husband passed, he the, she, she uh, gave you an artifact of is a famous artifact that um, she wanted you to have. Do, tell, tell us a little bit about that, if you would. I carry it to this day. She gave me President Roosevelt's cane. Now, people see me walking with my cane and wonder, well, she's walking fairly well. Why is she carrying the cane? Well, I didn't need the cane for support. It just looked well, it made me hold my head up higher, knowing where it came from. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. Boy, it has been a delight to interact with you, uh, Dr. Bethune. As I mentioned, our founder was a great fan of yours. Our organization is involved in an effort this year to have a K through 12 scholarship named for you. And we hope to be a part of a gathering that's going to take place later this year in Washington, DC, where a statue um, of you will be unveiled in Statuary Hall to represent uh, the state of Florida in the U.S. Capitol. So uh, though you are no longer um, with us in 2021, your legacy lives on, your memory is fresh, and um, we are indebted to you for the example that you set for all of us who are here in Florida, and perhaps especially for uh, young people who are no doubt inspired by your example. So thank you for appearing with us today on History Gone Viral. We wish you very well. Well, I wish myself well. It seemed like I was having a little bit of a nightmare there. You're telling me I'm no longer around and that there, I'm being honored. This must be a dream. <laughs> 
thank you for the latter part of that dream. <laughs> the conversation has been wonderful, but I've got to think about what you just said. <laughs> so if you'd like to um, uh, get more information about the James Madison Institute civics resources, by all means, let us know, contact us, and we will direct you to uh, resources that we have available for use in the classroom, some of which pertain to Dr. Bethune, others that pertain to other uh, great Americans that we uh, celebrate and honor. We'll be back again uh, next month with another edition of History Gone Viral. If you would like information, by the way, about how you could bring Dr. Bethune to your community to, to, for a performance, you can contact Ursula Odom um, uh, through the James Madison Institute or contact her directly through the Florida Humanities Council. Thank you again for your attention today on History Gone Viral. We are grateful for your participation. Good day.